Listening section three. Changes in intelligence. Exercise two. Listen to Martin, Maria, and Farouk discussing some project work. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hi Martin. Hi Maria. How are you getting on with your project? You've got to give the seminar on Friday, haven't you? Hi Farouk. We're getting on fine. It's just so interesting. Do you want to hear about it? Well, I've got ten minutes before my next lecture, so why not? Let's hear it. Great. And it'll help us to sort out who said what, won't it, Martin? That's right. You know what we've been looking at is research done by a number of psychologists from different parts of the world on intelligence quotients. How they've been rising over the last fifty years. Really? Yes. Some psychologists have measured increases in intelligence of up to twenty-five points in one generation. Amazing. What's causing us all to get cleverer? There's a political scientist from New Zealand called James Flynn. Well, he's a pioneer in this field, and he's found that people perform the visuospatial tasks in intelligence tests much better than they did fifty years ago. Partly, he puts this down to people playing with their PCs and watching TV, things like that. What about diet? Does that have anything to do with it? Perhaps. Robert Howard, a Sydney psychologist, thinks that it does. Just as eating better has made children taller, their average intelligence has also risen. He also says that parents are having fewer children, so they're able to pay more attention to them when they're small. It's fairly clear that stimulation in childhood has a positive effect on kids' intelligence. IQ tests have verbal and numerical elements too. Have these also been improving? Yes, but only moderately. It's the visuospatial element which has made the big difference. And Flynn also suggests that modern activities like driving may play a part in this. There's a British researcher, John Rust, who has made the general point that modern life is much more complicated than it was fifty years ago. Our intelligence has had to develop in order to cope with it all. Remember also that far more children have the opportunity to go to school nowadays. Howard thinks that must be a leading factor in improved IQ test performance. Well, yes, that would seem fairly obvious. To come back to John Rust, he suggests that as science and knowledge develop, ideas become more complex. Well, the people who produce these ideas, the Einsteins and Hawkings, are obviously highly intelligent people. But he says ordinary people's intelligence has also had to develop to cope with his new theories. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Are there any limits to intelligence, or will the human race just continue to get cleverer and cleverer? Well, actually, research in some Western industrialized countries, such as Australia, and some European countries, suggests that intelligence rose quite steeply for two or three decades, and then leveled off a few years ago. Some pessimists think that quite soon we may see it beginning to dip. In some countries, students seem to be less motivated than before. In that sense. There may well be a limit to intelligence. On the other hand, this rise in intelligence started to happen some years later in East Asian countries, the so-called Asian tigers, and it still hasn't levelled off. Is higher intelligence what has caused exam results to improve here in Britain? Do you think? Well, that's rather a political question, so it depends who you ask. But you must remember that thirty years ago, only about five percent of school leavers here went on to university. But there's been a vast expansion of the university system, and nowadays about thirty percent of young people get a higher education. So I guess exams must have been getting easier for all those people to get in. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
You will hear a talk about amber, the formation of amber and its applications in different fields. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tonight I'm going to present an overview of the research on amber. OK, I'll start by giving a brief introduction about amber, then talk about the formation of amber, and then describe amber's applications in different fields. First of all, what is amber? Amber is not a stone but is ancient fossilized tree resin, which is the semi-solid amorphous organic substance secreted in pockets and canals through epithelial cells of the plant. And why is resin produced? Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury inflicted by insects and fungi. Amber occurs in a range of different colors. Besides the usual yellow, orange, and brown, other uncommon colors are also associated with it. Interestingly, blue amber, the rarest Dominican amber, is highly sought after. It's only found in Santiago, Dominican Republic. There are several theories about what causes the blue color in amber. The most common one links it to the occurrence of volcanic dust that was present when the resin was first pressed out from Himnaya Proterra millions of years ago. At this point, you might be curious about how amber is formed. Molecular polymerization resulting from high pressures and temperatures produced by overlying sediment transforms the resin first into copal. Sustained heat and pressure drives off terpenes and results in the formation of amber. Copal that I've just mentioned is also a tree resin, but it hasn't fully fossilized to amber. More generally, the term copal describes resinous substances in an intermediate stage of polymerization and hardening between gummier resins and amber. So where can we find amber? It can be found on seashores. The main producer worldwide is Russia. In fact, about 90% of the world's available amber is located in the Kaliningrad region of Russia, which is located on the Baltic. Here, the resin is washed up on the coast after being dislodged from the ocean floor by years of water and ocean currents. However, exposure to sunlight, rain, and temperate extremes tends to disintegrate resin. This also indicates that amber is not really an ideal fossil preservative for most uses. We've already learned that amber is made of tree resin. It often includes insects that were trapped within the tree many millions of years ago. A piece with a visible and well-arranged insect is generally valued much higher than simple, solid amber. One Dominican amber source reported finding a butterfly with a five-inch wing spread. This is both a large and unusual find, and most butterfly specimens have no more than a two-inch wingspan. Inclusions in Dominican amber are numerous, one inclusion to every 100 pieces. 
Baltic amber contains approximately one inclusion to every 1,000 pieces. Now that you have a basic knowledge of amber, I'd like to talk a bit about amber's application in different fields. First, amber is appreciated for its color and beauty. Good quality amber is used to manufacture ornamental objects and jewelry. For instance, using a variety of exclusive, first-class quality natural Baltic amber with silver to make natural amber jewelry. But due to the biodegradation of amber fossils, people with amber jewelry have to take special care of it to ensure that the amber is not damaged. It was previously believed that amber worn on the neck served to protect one from diseases of the throat and preserved the sound mind. Calistrate, a famous doctor in the Roman Empire, wrote that amber powder mixed with honey cures throat, eye, and ear diseases, and if it is taken with water, eases stomachache. While the mystery around that use of amber has not been cleared, one thing is sure, it will help effectively to defeat small malaises. Amber has even been used as a building material. Amber created the altar in St. Brigida Church in Gdansk, Poland. In St. Petersburg, Russia, the walls of the famous Amber Room were lined with intricate carvings and inlaid designs. This palace room is being reconstructed from photographs and can be visited at the Catherine Palace, located in the town of Tsarkoya Selo. And finally, the fourth use of amber is that... Mm -hmm.